Dear Heavenly Father, on this Labor Day weekend, we give you thanks for the, the gift of work and to have jobs to provide for ourselves, but we also thank you for the gift of rest. And we're thankful for an extra day this weekend, and also you tell us that true rest is found in you and in your word. So we ask that as we spend time in Bible study and in church service today, hearing what you say to us in the Bible, help us to find rest and a trust in you and in your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So in our Bible study, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about Abraham. And Abraham is one of the most important people in the Bible. And we hear his story in the book of Genesis. And we've studied it for three weeks now, so we have a few things to review. So we'll start with just a few review questions. How is looking up at the stars... A reminder that God keeps his promises. Every time it's dark out at night and you go out and you see the stars, you can think God keeps his promises. Um, How so? Plus Abraham with his many descendants in the sun. That's what God did for Abraham. He took him outside and had to look up at the stars and said, As these stars are, so will your descendants be. And did God keep his promise? Absolutely. So the stars are kind of like the rainbow, right, that God gave to Noah. This mark of his promise. I'm not going to flood the earth. God put these signs into the world to help us remember his promises. Next one. Explain why this verse is so important. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him his righteousness. This is the first time the word believed. Excellent. This is the first time we hear the word believed. And so much of the Bible's message is about believing in the Lord, believing in Jesus. He believed before it came So good, we, we see that Abraham is believing in something that he can't see. You're going to hear that in our church service again today, that faith and hope are trusting in things we can't see. Excellent. So it's the first verse talking about belief. Points us ahead to things we can't see. Something else that this verse teaches us. That's really important. It was credited. What was credited? Righteousness. So how do we get right with God? Faith. By faith. It's a gift through faith. And again, by nature, we always think, well, if I'm going to be right with God, it's going to be based on me doing the right things. Okay? And so we feel this pressure, this guilt. I've got to do this and do this and do this, and then maybe I'll be right with God. And that's not how it worked for Abraham. Abraham believed the Lord. And God credited his faith, his righteousness. And last time we ended by looking at the book of Romans in the New Testament where it says, it's not just for Abraham that it works this way. This is how it works for all of us. When you believe God's promises of Jesus, God counts you as right. You're right with God through faith. Thanks. So what's significant about the fact that when God made his covenant with Abraham, only God walked through the animal carcasses? It was a unilateral covenant, which meant only God was doing the work. It didn't depend on what Abram did. Excellent. So first, if you weren't here last time, it sounds strange. But God and Abraham made an agreement in Genesis chapter 15. And in ancient times, when you were going to make an agreement, you took animals and cut them in half and put them on two sides with a little pathway in them. Remember why we said they did that? This is serious. Right? If every time you had to sign your name to something, if instead of just a piece of paper, they, they took some animals and cut them in half, and you have to look at, oh, you, this is a big deal, right? This is a big deal, right? If I break my word, something bad is gonna happen. So God does this with Abraham, put out these animal carcasses and but what's strange is that instead of them both walking through, as if we're both going to keep our agreement, just God walks through. Because like Jonah said, it was, it was just a one-sided covenant. God was the one doing everything. God was promising Abraham, I'm going to keep my promises. And even, Abraham, you might not. You might not always be faithful. In fact, you're going to sin, but I'm still going to keep my promise. That's the, the grace of God in, in the way he deals with us. Last one, we call Abraham Father Abraham because... We're all his descendants. How are we all Abraham's descendants? Faith. 
through faith. Through faith. So the New Testament tells us that everyone who has faith in Jesus, like Abraham did, is really a child of Abraham. So we call Abraham our father by faith. And his, his name means father of many. You're right. So he's got a good name. Any questions or comments that you have before we move on to something new today? So open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 16. And we're going to notice this as we go through the, the story of Abraham. That there's a whole bunch of ups and downs. We hear this really good thing. And then all of a sudden there's a surprisingly bad thing. And then there's a really good thing. And then there's a bad thing. And it sounds kind of like our lives on earth. Right? That being a Christian is not like, whoa, everything's getting better and better and better. That life is often this up and down. God's grace, our sin. God's grace, our sin. Here we have another chapter where Abraham does something disappointing. And it's the story of Hagar and Ishmael. And I have to admit, as I was finding out this Bible study, I thought, you know, this chapter we're going to go through pretty quickly. And maybe we'll do like two chapters in one day. And then as I was actually studying it, I, I decided, no. Because there's a whole lot in this chapter for us to think and talk about. So we're going to spend all day, well, maybe not all day, maybe like the next hour. We'll spend the next hour thinking about the story of Abraham and Hagar. So we're starting in Genesis chapter 16. I told you this isn't, this isn't a happy story. We'll start with verses 1 to 4. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, so she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah, took his, her, his, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Sound like a good plan? No, it sounds like a really dumb idea. <laughs> it sounds like a bad idea. Right? And this is where, what was the previous chapter all about? God's promise of what? A child. Right? The whole previous chapter was God's promise of a child. And maybe not all of you were here last time, but remember, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm your shield, your very great reward. And Abraham says, how can that be when I have no children? And what did God say? You're going to have children from your own body. You're going to have children. All right? And, and then the very next thing that Abraham and Sarah do is not not trust God's promise, come up with their own plan. Right? I think that one way you could describe what's happening is, here's the problem. God's not going fast enough. You think that's what Abraham and Sarah were thinking? God's not going fast enough. How long had they waited? Ten years. Plus, their whole marriage before that. But ten years since God's promise, that, that seems like long enough, right? God's not going fast enough. I need to make my own plan. Do we ever do that? All the time. Okay, can, can one of you, you know, you have to be honest about it, but think of a time in your life when you did this, when God was not going fast enough. And so you decided to take matters into your own hands. Just yesterday. <laughs> Just yesterday. What happened, Karen? I went grocery shopping. <laughs> uh-huh. That's good to know, Karen. Thanks for being honest. And so, we do this, don't we? We get these fears. We get these fears and these worries, and we God's not going to handle it, right? I better take things into my own hands. I don't, I don't think God's going to get me through. And so, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, somebody mentioned toilet paper. Isn't that a good example of just... Kind of random things that suddenly we panic and wow, there's no way I'm going to have this by God giving it. I got to do it. Right? And I think each one of us, maybe we need more time to think about it, but in our lives, haven't we done this? 
that you know what God's word says and you know his promises, but sometimes it takes too long. It doesn't seem to work out. And so he says, well, I got a better way. I'm going to do it my way. And how does that usually work out? Or not as good. Or sometimes not very bad. Okay, and so just have this, have this in your mind, right? If I think God's not working fast enough, the problem's with me. It's not with God. Right? God's calling on me to be patient. Now when you hear what Abraham and Sarah decide to do, I think our first reaction is to look at this really, really negatively, right? You think, like, this is not a good thing. How did they even think of this? Right? So I want us to try to look at it in two lights. First, in the negative way, kind of the normal way. What are all the bad things that seem to be happening here? Adultery. Adultery. So it's not right for a man to take another wife. That's wrong. Adultery. What else? Abraham all right, so there's this part that seems like Abraham's just letting Sarah decide things. Oh, you mean yeah. like Adam and Eve? Kind of, maybe like Adam and Eve. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, this would have been a good time for Abraham to say, All right, you know, I can see why you're suggesting this, Sarah, but no. He doesn't do that. He just goes along with it. Good. What else is bad? Lust. Lust is bad. They're not trusting God's promise, which is ultimately at the, the heart of everything. They're not trusting God's promise. Greed. Greed. They want it now. I want it now. I want it now. I'm not, God, I'm not waiting another 10 years. Let's just get this, get this over with. So there's Hagar in this, which is not just Abraham and Sarah, but they're involving somebody else. And you wonder what to say she had in all this. Right? And maybe she didn't have a sack. We don't know. But you're bringing another person into this who doesn't seem to be considered. And you're bringing somebody else into your own sinful actions. And that's not right. Right? And so it's easy for us to pick out all the things that are wrong. Could there, in any way, could we look at this kind of positively? This is what one of the commentaries I read it, it did this. Well, this is clearly wrong, but can, can we understand what they're thinking? Maybe put it more like that. Not look at it positively, but can we understand some of the things that they were thinking? What? They were really old. They were really old. They, they were, he really wanted to descend. So, in a positive light, what do they really want to have? A child. Is it a wrong thing to have a child? I mean, to want to have a child? No. They're, they're in a positive, they want to have a child. They also could have thought, we're going to make a promise. Yeah, so, uh, you know, just from our human thinking, is it wrong to try to help God out? I mean, helping is usually a good thing, right? And so, to want to have a child, there's nothing wrong with that, right? To think maybe. Maybe God's waiting for us to do something to help him out. We can certainly understand that. And uh, remember what God had said to Abraham, where this descendant was going to come from? From his own body. Does that still work in this plan that they come up with? Yes. It does. Right, of course, God was talking about Abraham and Sarah, but from, well, this, maybe, maybe this is what God's even talking about. All right, so this is a way that Abraham can have his own child through his own his own body, and right? so we can we can maybe understand. You say, how could somebody even do this in the first place? Well, you know, sometimes as Christians, we we think that we're thinking good thoughts, and then we end up in a bad place. Now, uh, maybe you could see the same thing for Abraham and Sarah. That's how they rationalize it. They could rationalize it. Oh well, God must have put. Specific reason, yeah. right? This well, back way. This makes sense. We can just do it like this. One of the things that I read was the the commentator said Sarah and Abraham had the right what, but they had the wrong how. What do you think about that? They had the right what, 
promoted. But the, the wrong how. Outcome. Yeah. So what would be the right what? What was what was it that they were hoping? A child. A child. This guy's proud. It was wrong for them to want a child. They had the right what, but they had the wrong how. What should have the how been? Patience. Sarah. Patience and wait for God to work this out. And with Sarah, instead they took it into their own hands, and I just thought that that was that was an insightful way to describe this. They had the right what, but they had the wrong how. And I wonder, do you think that this happens to us sometimes too? All the time. That we have the right what, but the problem is the wrong how. I came up with just a few examples. You might be able to come up with some more, but let's just look at these one at a time. For each good, what? Right, some good and some not some so good hows. So, take a little break. There we go. I want happiness. You or I think to ourselves, you know, I really, I really want to be happy. Is that wrong? No. Okay, now the Bible promises we're not always going to have a great circumstances in life, right? You might not always feel like this happiness, but to want to be happy, that's a good what? Right? The Bible says rejoice, always. Okay? Happiness is a good thing. What would be some wrong hows? I want to be happy, this is a good thing, so I'm going to... Go shopping. <laughs> go Oh, you said that. I didn't say it. That was all you. That, Go shopping. I'm going to spend some money. And that's going to make me happy. Cheer for the Yankees. <laughs> Maybe just, I'm going to find it in sports. I'm just going to throw myself into watching and following sports all the time. And, okay, now with those two, are like shopping or watching sports in and of themselves wrong. No, the problem is it's not going to give us lasting happiness, right? Going shopping will make you happy for a little while until it catches up to you, and then it won't be so happy. And sports can really make you happy unless you cheer for the wrong team or they're going through a bad season, and then you're not so happy. And, right? So we've got this good what, I want to be happy, but the how can be off, isn't it? Well, not doing bad uh, dishonest. Good. Or to yeah. So Ken is thinking more like me about the bad things. <laughs> well, right? So the, what, what would be some bad ways to yeah. find happiness? Get high, get plastic. So drugs, <laughs> or alcohol, you know, or stealing. Okay, how often isn't the well, why, why is somebody using drugs or alcohol? It's, I want to be happy. Or immoral sex. Right, or, yeah, sex outside marriage. Right, so the one is a good thing. Happiness. You may not want that. But the how, that's what we have to be careful about. Okay, so I said, the Bible says rejoice always. Okay? But I'm cutting out part of the verse. How does that verse actually go? Rejoice makes you happy. What words come between rejoice always? In the Lord. In the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. So the one happiness, that's a good thing. What's the real how? How are we going to find a happiness that doesn't just end when the credit bill comes? Through the Lord. Okay, so one happiness, good. One happiness. But look for happiness through the Lord. Through His blessings. Okay, next one. I want children. Is that an okay want for somebody to have? Yes. yes. Right. In fact, this is something maybe we should say more. Because you know, children are kind of looked at sometimes not as blessings as much today. And the Bible says children is a wonderful thing. God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and fill up the earth. All right. So children are to want children. This is a good thing. Okay, but the how matters. What would be not so good hows? Abduction. <laughs> so kidnapping. Kidnapping would not be the way. To want children is good. But don't take somebody else's. That wouldn't be good. Outside of marriage. So 
just looking for, I'm going to have sex outside of marriage. I don't care about that relationship or what God said. I'm just trying to have a baby. I, I actually, one, one of my trips when I was in Mexico, learning Spanish. Uh, so when you're trying to learn a language, it's the job of the people teaching you just to talk to you. Which can kind of be a hard job because they just have to talk to you all the time. And you don't really know Spanish well, right? So you can't really say anything. So it's just kind of like if you want a job, just talking constantly, just teach somebody another language, right? I remember one, one, one of the years I was learning Spanish, the, the lady was telling me, you know, this is really common in Mexico. We Mexican women, we don't, we don't want to get married because we don't trust men. And so we don't, I mean, Mexican men, they're not faithful, they're not, I don't ever want to get married, but we want children. And so, this is why a lot of Mexican women will just, well, we just want a one night stand because we just, I just want a baby, but I don't want the man that comes with it. And she was honest about this is, there's a lot of ladies who think like this, right? I, I want the child, but I don't want a marriage. I don't want a man to go with it. You, well, that, that desire for a child, that's a good thing. Okay, but the how, the how matters. Right? And so, if there's somebody who wants to have children, what would be the, the biblical how? What should that person do? Be married. Be married. Well, before children is to think, well, maybe I should, I should look for a godly spouse. And it takes time. Right? I shouldn't rush. It might take years. I should look and see if God provides me with somebody to marry. And then once we get married, then I look and see if God provides me with children. And so to want children, this is a good thing. Okay, there's a way that the Bible teaches us to go about that. Ultimately, if we're not able to have children, does that make us less of people? Does that mean our life was less blessed by God? No. All right, so the what is a good thing, but the how matters. Yeah, we could apply this to a lot of different things. Can we? I just have two more. I want to feel needed. Join a cult. I'm sorry. I think I think we all have that desire, right? Okay. I think deep down, I want I want to know that people care about me. I want to know that people need me. Is that a bad thing? No. No. Because we really do need each other. You really are important to society. But what would be some bad hows? I want to feel needed, so I'm going to... I need relations. So, so I'm going to look for relationships that aren't, aren't according to what God's plan. If Jonah said, I'm going to join a cult. I'm going to be a part of some kind of closed-in group that's just, just so I feel needed, which is this is why people join groups like that, right? I just want to, I want to feel like I'm part of something. Okay? Anything else? Or join a gang. Or join a gang. This, this is what leads sometimes young people, right, to give in to peer pressure. I'm going to do whatever my friends tell me to do. And it's not just young people who do that. I'm just going to go along with the crowd. I want to feel needed. It's a good what? Or um, overuse of social media. I don't, yeah, so overuse of social media. This is why so many of us so often spend so much time just on the internet. I'm just going to find my, my feeling of needed by connection with other people. Yeah, and then you get depressed when you don't get as many likes. And it doesn't help, right? It doesn't actually help. Okay, so if I want to feel needed, this is a good what. What would be the Bible's how? You're needed at church. Yeah. Look at the relationships God's already given you. Every single one of us is a part of relationships that God's put in our life. Right? Look at your family, your parents, your children, your grandchildren, your spouse. Okay, you are needed. Find ways to serve them. Look at your, your job or where you volunteer. God's put you in that position. Serve and you'll be needed. Then look at the Christian church. Remember how the Bible compares the Christian church to what thing? The church is like a body a body and how many parts of your body do you need all of them so join a christian church and find ways to so it's good to want to feel needed but look for the ways that god's provided opportunities for you to serve other people right last one 
I want to be saved. So I'm going to do it myself. Is that, first of all, is that a good what? Yeah. Yes, it's good to want to be saved, but the wrong house, so I'm going to do it myself. What might that look like? So, somebody mentioned suicide, and that's a true thing. Right? I just want to get out of this world. I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one to decide when I get to go to heaven. And that's the wrong how, right? It's God. It's God who decides that. Are the wrong hows for being saved? Works. Works righteousness. I'm going to do all the right things, right? I'm going to make myself better than other people. Or uh, the prosperity gospel. I'm going to make it feel like I'm getting saved, and everything's going to, everything good's going to come because of that. Good. I'm going to look for wealth and health and prosperity, and that'll be the sign that I'm being saved. And, okay, it's a good what. Wrong. Now, what's the right how for being saved? Faith in Jesus. And where does faith in Jesus come from? Holy Spirit. Hearing God's word. And so if I want to be saved, well, I'm going to, as much as I can control, hear God's word. And let the Holy Spirit work in my heart. Okay, so as you go through life, just, just think about this. There's, there's a lot of good things. It's good to want things. There's some good what's. Often the problem isn't the what. It's the how. And maybe this can sometimes help us understand other people's actions, too. Sometimes we're quick to judge somebody else. They say, well, why on earth did they do that? And when you look at what they did, you could say, well, you know what? They actually, they wanted the right thing. They were really trying to get a good thing. The problem isn't, isn't the thing. It's, it's how they went about doing it. That's the problem. I just, I just was reading an article about a, a man who his whole life he's been trying to impersonate police officers and he actually started when he was 14 when he was 14 years old he walked into a Chicago police station wearing a police uniform and he convinced them that he was actually a Chicago police officer and for five hours he went out on patrol as a 14 year old with his uniform and everything. And he's saying, is that bad? You said, well, what he wants isn't necessarily bad. Isn't it a bad thing to want to be a police officer? That's a pretty good desire, isn't it? The problem is the, the how. That you can't just show up and pretend there's a process for this. And the sad thing for this man is that it's kind of become like his life's passion that like six different times now, he's been arrested for a person named Fleet, and he'll go to jail, and he'll come out, and and he'll do it again. And people will ask, like, "Why do you do this?" And he'll say, "I don't. I can't really explain. I just really want to be a police officer." And, and get the desire—it's a good desire. And sadly, because he's had so many felonies now, he's, he can't be a police officer, which is, you know, you've excluded yourself from the very thing that you wanted, and so. Don't just examine what is it that I'm looking for, but how am I going about it? That can really matter. How did he get to be? He must have been hooked over that he was. Yeah, this is what, it, I guess it made the national news when he did this the first time. He was 14 years old and he went out in a police car and they actually arrested some people and he, 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 had, he wanted to be a policeman enough that he knew what to do. Like he knew the code words, he knew it, it, it wasn't until the end of the whole shift that they finally figured out, oh, you're actually not a police officer. So he had a good what, but he had the wrong how. Did he say that every time? That's what was this article did not explain. Why didn't, I think because he didn't want to wait. I don't think you can go to the police academy when you're 14 years old. And so, similar to Abraham, right? I wanted this. And, uh, did they give him a gun? I'm not sure they gave him a gun. That's a good question. It didn't go into all the details. Some volunteer. So, what's that? Uh, well, it's, I don't know. It's kind of impressive that this guy, you kind of read the story like, this isn't a good thing, but I'm surprised this guy could pull it off. It's kind of what you say. All right, before we move on, one other thing in these verses. I told you, I saw a lot as I was reading through this chapter. In marriage, spouses can work together for great good or great evil. 
don't know if I, I always think this too, but if you're married, you and your spouse can work together in a powerful way for good or for evil. How might Abraham have kept Sarah from sinning further? So you think about God, God's given a marriage. Is, we're partners in this. So Sarah comes to Abraham and says, you know, Abraham, it doesn't seem to be working to just wait. I've got this idea. Here's my idea. You know, for Sarah to bring this to her husband, that's not, it's not wrong. It's a bad idea. But it's not wrong for her to bring it up. And this is where, if, if their marriage is working well, what could Abraham have said? No. 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 no, no, no. He might have said it in a kind way. Like, I just know, but you know, Sarah, I, I appreciate your willingness to do this. This was a big sacrifice on Sarah's part, right? To have her husband take another wife. This was a huge sacrifice. She probably thought she was doing a good thing. Abraham could have said, you know, Sarah, I appreciate your willingness to offer this, but this is not the way we're going to do it. We're going to keep trusting in God. Abraham could have kept Sarah from sinning. On the flip side, how might Sarah have kept Abraham from sinning for him? Changed her mind. Not showing up in the first place. Maybe not have the idea in the first place, but you just see how it's not who's to blame for the story. It's really both of them, right? Instead of both working together to encourage each other, right, they end up working together to come up with a plan against God. Right? Can you think of examples from the Bible of spouses who either served as a great encouragement to each other or who led each other away from God? Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve, was that a good or a bad example? Bad example. Bad example. You go back to the devil's temp tempting Eve at the Garden of Eden. and You just think, there's ways this could have gone differently, right? So Adam is right there. And the devil tempts Eve, and what could Adam have said? No. No, let's go away. Let's not stand here anymore. Let's not talk to the snake. This doesn't seem like a good idea, but does he do any of those things? No. No. Right? You see, there's an example of a marriage. There's two people meant to be working together, but instead they end up falling away. Can you think of other examples in the Bible like that? Ahab and Jezebel. Right. Another good example or bad example? Bad example. So Ahab is this ungodly king who worships idols, and then he marries Jezebel, who worships even more idols. And they just go right into it. And so each of them play off each other to make Israel worse and worse and worse. So I mentioned a good example. What did you say? Mary and Joseph. Right. Think of how Mary and Joseph, they're, they're the opposite. Kind of, Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph could have just, I've not, not, not anything to do with this. But instead, what does Joseph do? He believes her. And he supports her. It took, took an angel along the way. That was helpful. But Joseph supports her. And Joseph and Mary work together to, to raise the Son of God. So there's a good example. Are there examples that come to mind? Throughout the law, yeah, his wife, and to Lot kept the faith, and his wife turned back. And... Yeah, so Lot and his wife. Let's maybe let's maybe hold off that one because we're going to read the story in a couple weeks. Uh, okay. But but we'll bring it up. So Lot and his wife. We'll have to talk about them when we get to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Ananias and Sapphira. So do you recognize the names Ananias and Sapphira? Mm -hmm. They're the ones who get put put to death. In the New Testament for lying to God and it sounds like they just collaborated together they said let's sell a field and then give part of the money to the church but we're going to tell everybody we gave everything and then we'll look really good and again one of the two could have said you know let's let's not do that or let's let's just be honest and say we're giving part of the money right? but they didn't instead they they fed off of each other. So for us who are, are married, just think about this. You don't have to answer this question right now. But what are you and your spouse practicing together? Yeah, I just think that's kind of a powerful question. In our, in our marriage, 
are, are we encouraging each other closer to God? Or in our marriage, do we sometimes help each other pull away from God? And here you've got Abraham and Sarah as a, as a negative example at this point. In other places, there'll be a positive example, but right, in a marriage, we have the power to pull us closer or further away from Jesus. That was a lot of just three and a half verses. Any questions you have or comments on just those three and a half verses? Now you better keep going. So next we're going to keep go reading verses 4 to 6. We're actually right in the middle of verse 4. Depending on how your Bible is laid out. In the middle of verse 4, it says, When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands. Abram said, Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from him. So first of all, how does this story show the disastrous effects of polygamy? Having more than one spouse. It doesn't work out. Now, this is an area where some people... Uh, Criticize the Bible for not saying more against polygamy. You, you know from what you know in the Bible that there's a number of men in the Bible who have more than one spouse. And sometimes people say, well, the Bible doesn't make a huge deal about pointing out how bad this is. And maybe the Bible doesn't say words like that, but every time a man in the Bible has more than one wife, it doesn't work out well. And this would be an example. And so they've got this plan. You think it would work. But what results from this polygamous relationship? The household kind of falls apart. Everything falls apart. Okay, there's this rivalry between the, the spouses, which, how would there not be? Right? Hagar, she starts to make fun of Sarai because she's got a job and Sarai doesn't. Sarai gets envious and angry about it. And here's Abraham. And You'd think it'd be good to have two wives, right? And I don't think Abraham was thinking it was a good thing. He's thinking, why did I, one is enough. Why did I, why did I do this? Yeah, so did Abraham think of Hagar as a wife or as just... Yeah, if you notice, notice the, the translation, it clearly says wife. So if you look at, at least my translation does, like in verse 3. So he gave, gave her to her husband to be his wife and... So th this was a common practice in the ancient world, that if a woman couldn't produce an heir, that she'd maybe take a servant. And, and so that servant, it, it was his wife, but they would have kind of levels of wives, which of course is all messed up, right? But Sarai would have been, you know, his wife, but Hagar was, Hagar was too, and the child was his, was his child. There's no doubt about that, okay? Is this where divorce comes in? Yeah, so this isn't, divorce comes in even if there are two wives, right? Which is a sad thing. But this all just shows how marriage gets messed up, right? And so you think, oh, this will be good, and I'll have two wives, and it'll make me happier. No, not the way it works out. Okay? Sometimes people talk about how sin snowballs, like a snowball going down a hill, it picks up and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and... One sin leads to another, another, another. So how did sin continue to snowball for, here we got our three people. So Hagar, and we're not sure what part she played in all this, but she was part of it. Okay, and how does her sin keep growing? She gets pregnant, and what does she do? She, she mistreats her, her mistress, her, her master, really. And that wasn't right. Okay, and so she commits a sin with Abraham. Again, we're not sure what part she played, but she was there. And, and now she's pregnant, and she, she makes Sarai envious and mistreats her. That's not good. Okay, how does Sarai, Sarah's sin just keep snowballing? What does she do next? 
She blamed her husband. All right. So Abraham was partly responsible, but it seemed like this was Sarah's idea to begin with, right? And so her sin just keeps going. Now she's going to blame Abraham. And this isn't good. And how about Abraham? He just kind of he tries to shirk all responsibility and say, "Yeah, you do what you want." So his sin grows because he just doesn't take responsibility, right? And so to say, "Well, now all you just do, you figure it out." That's not what he was called to do. Now he's got another wife, and he's got a, a child on the way through her. And so you just see in the story how one sin always leads to another, and another, and another. And sometimes in our minds, don't we think, well, I'll just do this one thing, and that'll be it. And that's never how it works, is it? Right? One sin leads to another, and another, and another. And so first the problem was, well, we, we have to be patient and wait for a son. And now the problem is we've got rival wives and bitterness in the household and it's division and it's getting worse. Sin doesn't make things better, it makes things worse. Let's keep reading. Here's what happens to Hagar. So chapter 16, verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, hey, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarah, she answered. And the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are not pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Ba'ir Lachai Rory. And it is still there between Kadesh and Barak. So as a result of all this conflict, Hagar is forced to flee. I guess we're not told that she's forced. Sarah mistreats her, and she decides the best thing to do is to flee. And you don't probably recognize these place names, but where does it seem Hagar is fleeing to? Could you guess? Where was she from? Egypt. Egypt. Seems like she's fleeing on the road back to Egypt. That's where she was from. And as she's on the way, this is the first place in the Bible that we hear about an important figure. <laughs> the angel of the Lord. And so as Hagar is fleeing, you think that'd be the end of the story, right? She'll go back to Egypt, that's it. But instead, the angel of the Lord appears to her. And this is the first place in the Bible we hear about the angel of the Lord. From this story, who is the angel of the Lord? Holy Spirit. So let's let's use the, the words that the story uses. What words does this story use for who the angel of the Lord is? Especially if you look at verse 13. Yeah, the Lord. Or God. Look again at verse 13. She gave this name to who spoke to her? To the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For I have now seen the one who sees me. So as you go through the Old Testament, we run into this, this figure, the angel of the Lord. And just from that title, the first thought that comes to our mind is that it's an angel of the Lord. But as you hear this angel of the Lord talk and act, it's clear that often the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. And then that leads us to say, well, how does this work? And well, we understand how this works because of the Trinity. What is the teaching of the Trinity? How many gods are there? One. One, and yet God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so to hear that God sends God is just in line with how the whole Bible talks. Okay, so the angel of the Lord is the Lord sent out by the Lord. And now 
know, this is beyond our understanding. Um, often people will say, well, this makes us think especially about Jesus. That in the Old Testament, perhaps the angel of the Lord is, this is, this is Jesus. It never said that specifically. And so we have to be a little careful about saying more than what the Bible says. But certainly, the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself taking on a form to appear to people and talk to them. It makes us think about how in the New Testament Jesus did become a human being and talk with us. And I read one commentator who says, you know, in both the Old and New Testament, the focus is really on God who comes to us. In the Old Testament, it's the angel of the Lord. In the New Testament, it's Jesus. Sam? I guess what I'm finding interesting now that we're dissecting this is that she obviously believed in the true God instead of the false gods of Egypt. Good. So with Hagar, it's clear that she believes in the Lord. Okay. This is one of the things we could have brought up you know, back when we were thinking about things in a positive light. And so there's some comments. So if, if Hagar is the chief servant of Sarah, that makes us think of how Abraham had a chief servant. Remember his name? Eliezer. Eliezer. When we hear about Eliezer in the Bible, Eliezer seems like the most faithful man in the world. And we hear about Eliezer later when Abraham wants to find a, a, a wife for his son, Isaac. I, I don't want to spoil the story. Abraham is actually going to have a son <laughs> named Isaac. And Eliezer, it's going to be his job to find a believing wife. And Eliezer does everything just perfectly. He seems like a faithful believer in God. And so, if Abraham's chief servant is a faithful believer in God, what would you expect about Sarah's chief servant? Faithful believer in God. You'd expect her to be a faithful believer in God, too. And so we're not really told a lot about Hagar, but just from this family, we, we assume that the most trusted maidservant that Sarah has is, is also a faithful believer in the Lord. And that comes out in this story, that this angel, the Lord, appears to Hagar, and she says, this is the Lord, with all capital letters, right? That special name for God that just the people of God used. And so Hagar had faith in the, the Lord, and the Lord himself appeared to her. Just as one other example of the angel of the Lord, keep your finger here in Genesis chapter 16. Turn ahead to Exodus chapter 3. That's not far, just the very next book is Exodus. Genesis, Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 3, we hear about the angel of the Lord. And it's just another example of how the Bible talks about the angel of the Lord. In Exodus chapter 3, it's the story of Moses at the burning bush. So we're fast forwarding. This is Moses now. And the angel of the Lord is going to appear to Moses at the burning bush. But just like in the story with Hagar, just notice how the Bible talks about this angel of the Lord. So Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So again, we've got the angel of the Lord appearing to Moses from the bush. And who is the angel of the Lord? The Lord, it's really clear, right? Over and over again, the Lord spoke. God, God, God. And so, when you hear about this angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, just recognize this is, this is a special thing. Usually it seems like it's God himself. Maybe not every time, right? But usually it seems like this is God himself. And it makes us think about the Trinity, maybe even of Jesus in the Old Testament.
Questions about that? Why do you safely say that the angel of the Lord is an extension of the Holy Spirit? So some people would say maybe this is more like the Holy Spirit working in. That's where I, I think we can we can conclusively say this is God, it's the Lord. We can say the Trinity helps us understand this. I think we want to be a little careful to say too much. Right? So most most Lutheran commentators, instead of focusing on the Holy Spirit, would say this makes us think about Jesus. The the fancy term would be this is the pre incarnate Christ. This is Jesus before he became a human being. But again, I think we'd have to say it doesn't explicitly say that. So this is God on earth. And we probably don't think about God the Father. It makes us think about Jesus or the Holy Spirit coming down here on earth to deal personally with human beings. Good questions. But there's a distinction here mm-hmm. that we don't have in other places. We think there's God, God the Father. This says the angel of the Lord. So there's a distinction in this particular person. And what's the distinction? Just like follow you. The, the terminology. Mm-hmm. Like the angel of the Lord. Yeah, the angel of the Lord. Yes. Yep. And this is where I'm, if you want to study something, you could just look up every time the phrase the angel of the Lord shows up in the Old Testament. And there's a bunch of them. And so we really wanted to say that that's what we should do. And then read the whole story every single time the angel of the Lord shows up. And see what we find out. You know, is every single time is that angel of the Lord talked of as God? Or sometimes does it seem like it's it's an angel? And sometimes it seems like it's an angel, right? And so this is where in this story, there's clearly this marker. She sees the angel of the Lord, and then she says, I saw the Lord. And so here's a case where this must be God coming down and talking personally with Hagar. Well, and is the this earlier, like in the Garden of Eden, God spoke mm-hmm. with Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. And it seems like it was in person. Yeah. But... So what's why is it saying God then and now it's saying the angel of the Lord? What, yeah. Good what question. Is, so in the, in the Garden of Eden, it says that the, the God would come and, and talk and walk with Adam and Eve in right. the garden. There's so much here that we can't we can't say more than what the Bible says. So Adam and Eve had this perfect relationship with God. And so how does that compare? God in the Garden of Eden walking with Adam and Eve. How does that compare to the angel of the Lord? coming and talking to Hagar. There must be connections, right? So I guess what's different is here we have this, this different title, the angel of the Lord. And how this all works, we'll see when we get to heaven. Right? But we want to reckon this is God. Right? This is God. And that makes us special. And we want to make sure we don't, we don't miss over what, what promises did the angel of the Lord actually give to Hagar? Because what the angel says is really important. It doesn't sound like this your offspring no, says, it doesn't sound all good, maybe. Some of the things sound good. Your offspring will be uncomfortable. Uncom- dropping everything today. I don't know why I'm dropping everything. Some of the things sound good. What things are good? Your offspring will not be able to be comfortable. So, Hagar, you're going to have this baby. Yeah. Right? Now remember, she's fleeing in the middle of the desert as a pregnant lady. This couldn't have been easy. Right? And I, I bet part of her mind was, is the child going to come? What's, we're all going to die. What's going to happen? God, no, Hagar. This child's going to be born. It's so certain, I'll tell you what his name is. Which was? Ishmael. Ishmael which is pretty God says your child's going to have a name. You know that child's going to be born. And there's going to be all sorts of descendants. Right. And so it's not just you, the two of you. There's going to be this huge family. You hear about Ishmael had 12 sons. Just like Jacob later had 12 sons. Ishmael had 12 sons. He became... A great nation. It doesn't all sound good. Why did you say that, Melanie? Well, it says that his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he'll live in futility. Yeah. Like and what? All of his brothers. What? There's just a great phrase about him. You didn't mention the best part. The wild donkey. Of it's going to be a wild donkey of a man. Isn't that? I don't know. Some men would probably take that as a compliment, don't you think? This man's going to be a wild donkey of a man. Clearly, the, the angel is. 
God, God is telling the truth that your, your son is going to be born. Don't worry, he's going to be great and powerful. But you should know this, Hagar, this, this hostility, this conflict, it's going to continue. And so the result of Abraham and Sarah's sin, this bringing another family into the mix, that's going to continue ultimately forever. And so Ishmael and his descendants went on to become nations too, and they were often fighting against the Israelites, and this is, this is going to be a, a reality. And so the angel comes, and the angel makes some big promises. Right? Certainly, some are positive, some just hint at, this isn't all going to be, it's not all going to be happy. Yeah. The, the promise of a son. This was very important in their culture. Yeah. So just to have a son, this was a really important thing. Okay, so clearly Hagar, after God speaks to her, does she view it as a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing. Clearly she, this was a good thing, right? The message, it wasn't all, everything's going to be great. But this was a good thing. God spoke to her, and so she's going to go back. She recognizes God speaking to her, and She's going to go back. What name did she give to God? Because I've got it up here for you. You are the God who sees me. In Hebrew, that would be El Roy. Isn't that a great name for God? And so you think, as Hagar is fleeing, just imagine what was going through her mind. Now, if she's a believer in God, it seems like she is. Everything is awful, right? She was living this pretty nice life, being the chief maidservant of a very important couple who were God-fearing it. Now all of a sudden, she's fleeing for her life, all alone, in the middle of the desert, not sure what's going to happen next. And who still cares about her? God. Who still sees her? God. And she says, God, you are, you are the God who sees me. The living God. The living God. You can take comfort in that too. Whatever it is that you're facing, you can feel alone and deserted and discouraged. And you have a God who sees you. Yeah. Elroy, the God who sees. That's who our God is. Let's see how it finishes. Verses 15 and 16. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So she goes back, and a child's born. Right? The name Ishmael, did you pick out what it means? God hears. God hears. Okay? That's the same meaning as another name in the Old Testament. There's someone else given the name, a name. God hears because God heard the prayer of someone. Yes. No, but no guesses. Yes. Samuel. 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 Remember Samuel's mother? You don't have to remember, but the story Samuel's mother yes. also couldn't have children, Hannah. And she went to the temple over and over and prayed to God, and God heard yes. and gave her a son, and so she named him yes. Samuel. So Samuel and Ishmael. Both seem to mean the same thing. It's God. God hears. It's a good name for a son, especially for someone who wasn't expecting a son. And as we wrap up, we, we want to see not just the sin in the story, but how does God illustrate His grace to the different people involved? So the sin is pretty clear. But God's grace is His undeserved love, even to sinners who don't deserve it. How does God show His grace to Hagar? We can list off a lot of things. He appears to her. Yeah. He keeps her safe. He gives her promises. Yeah. Okay, and so even this this slave, well, maybe we thought she doesn't really matter, right? Just get rid of her. No, not to God. And this slave went on to have descendants who were very powerful people because of God's promise. How does God show His grace to Sarah and Abraham? He still lets him have a son. He doesn't give up on him. Right? If you follow the story of Abraham, at what point would you have said, let me go find somebody else? Right? Enough with this. 
And remember, the covenant, whom did the covenant depend on? God. Just on God. Not on Abraham. Right? It's, it's really amazing to think about. Abraham and Sarah couldn't mess this up. They tried to. They did some stupid things. It was God who was going to make his covenant work. Denise? And he doesn't punish them. He doesn't even punish them. Which we would have at least done something, right? To punish them. You could say that all this conflict was, that was part of the consequence, but God continues to show them his love. Do you suppose they thought their plan worked? worked? Did they think that their plan worked? Uh, that's a really good question. So if you look at the next story, the next story is God coming to Abraham and giving him promises again. We have this up and down. The next story starts when Abraham was 99 years old. So 13 years go by. That's a good question. During those 13 years, what were Abraham and Sarah thinking? Were they thinking, well, this is how it's going to be? Or I, I really think that they, they realized that wasn't the right plan. But I don't know that you could say that, I suppose, from the Bible. Just for me reading the story, I, I think they recognize, nope, it's still going to be the two of us. Good question. <laughs> yeah, they probably weren't patient the whole 13 years. That's probably true. Just some last questions. How does this story show that children are a blessing from God? Because when God wants to bless somebody, he gives them children. God gives people children when God decides to do it. Right? And hopefully we realize that. I, I think that when I was younger, I didn't really think that way. He just thought, well, you know, we'll have kids when we want to have kids. It doesn't really work that way, does it? No, right? You have children when, when God decides to give you children. And that's a cool way. If you just look at Sarah's words, her words don't sound good, but they're true. If you look at verse 2, the first thing that Sarah says, the Lord has kept me from having children. Was that true? Yes, well, I don't think she said it in a, in a faithful way. She was complaining. But this was true. Okay, children are a blessing from God. And if somebody is allowed to have a child, even if it's under circumstances like Hagar, this is a blessing from God. Every child is. <laughs> right? When we're faced with troubles, what are not good solutions? Sometimes the Bible teaches us good things. Sometimes it teaches us don't do this. What are not good solutions? Taking in our own hands. Going to deny God's word, do my own thing. That's not a good solution. Sin. Sin is not a good solution. Okay. How about even for Hagar? What was not a good solution for Hagar? Running away. Running away. Running away isn't a good solution either. Even for Hagar. The best thing was for her to stay and serve. That's what God called her to do. Right? What is a good solution? Patience. Trust in God. Patiently wait on the Lord for His forgiveness and His plan to play out. That's a better solution. Two last statements just about this story. Explain what, what each of these statements means. People sin did not nullify God's covenant. Can you break his promise? still be promise. God's promise was still good. It's still in place. Even when people sin. Right? Even for us today, sometimes I'll have people ask, you know, every time I sin, am I falling out of salvation? You ever thought about that? Every time I sin, have I lost heaven? And then and then it comes back. You know, are we are we bouncing in and out of the saints? And what's the answer? No. no, because how are you part of God's family? Because God chose us. God's, God's covenant with you. Right? Now, the one way to, to fall out of God's family would be to, to reject God, to stop believing in God. Right? But sin doesn't nullify God's promises. Second, God always keeps his promises regardless of our faithfulness. Thank you. Thank goodness. Aren't those just good? Good things for us to know. We, we're not always faithful. We're often not faithful, but God is. 
And so our faith and our lives are based on God's faithfulness, not on us. And we see that here in this story. So, some of, some of you know, but we're going to hear about Hagar and Ishmael again in the future. There's another chapter of the <coughs> conflict and Hagar running away again. So this will come up again. It's kind of repetition in Abraham's story. Right? God's grace, people sin. God's grace, people sin. Come back again next week. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord God, it's good for us to study your word. Even chapters like this, which maybe at first glance don't have a lot to say to us, even chapters like this are filled with, with your word for us. Thank you for letting us study Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. Lord, forgive us for all the times that we've taken matters into our own hands. Forgive us for when we've had the right what, but the wrong how. Help us to trust in you, even in the middle of troubles. And please keep your promises to us. When we're unfaithful, you still are faithful. May your love be truly grace, undeserved love for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.